Welcome to the funeral service for Lila Irene Johnson Butterfield. I'm going to read through the entire program, so it's part of the, the record and recording they have. Lila Irene Johnson Butterfield was born February 9th, 1932 in Preston, Idaho. She died February 19th, 2021 in Providence, Utah. Paul Bearers will be... Mitch Butterfield, Jerry Gill, Wayne Allen, Colby Gill, Blake Brower, Justin Allen, Gabe Moreland, Jake Ellen. Honorary pallbearers are Braxton Gill, Carter Gill, Brevin Gill, Ashton Ellen, Dylan Butterfield, Braden Moreland, Lincoln Bo Moreland, Kate Allen, Caden Curry, Brody Brower, Bentley Brower, Riley Brower and Garrett Brower. Today is February 26th, 2021. Uh, as I said, I'm Bishop Tyre from the province second world. Family prayer was just held and uh, Wayne Allen, the son-in-law, offered that prayer. We appreciate uh, Sister Sarah Baugh and Jeannie Brill helping with the music today. Uh, our opening hymn will be, I Stand All Amazed. And the opening prayer will be given by Cass Brower, a granddaughter. And we'll go to that point. <laughs>
Our dear Heavenly Father, we gather here today to celebrate the life of Irene Butterfield. We are grateful for her example of happiness and her example of laughter. Heavenly Father, please be with us today. Be with her children and her family and friends. And please help us with thy comfort. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the knowledge that we have that we will be together again, that we will see her again. We're thankful for our time with her and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, next to hear a celebration of life uh, from Shelly Gill, a daughter, followed by memories of mom from Holly Allen, a daughter. Then we'll be privileged to hear a musical number, Crazy, uh, offered by Ross Thomas. Then we'll hear from Larry and Joyce Smart and Jeannie Burrell uh, uh, from the Second Ward. Then we'll have a congregational hymn, My Heavenly Father Love Me. And we'll go to that point. Shall we? I'd like to welcome everybody here that took the time out to honor my mother. And I would really like to mention the program cover that was designed by Holly. We just couldn't find what, what we really wanted. And Holly's very talented in that area. And without even seeing what the flowers was, it, very, it just complimented everything. I appreciate that, sis. Irene Butterfield passed away with failing health at Cache Valley Assisted Living in Providence, Utah, where she had resided for 10 months. She was born on February 9, 1932 in Preston, Idaho. She had just celebrated her 89th birthday and Holly and I was able to give her some cookies and have her coffee. And she was just Irene then. We just loved to visit with her. Lila Irene Johnson was William E. Johnson and Lila Mae Johnson's first daughter. Irene had one sister, Maxine, her husband, Warner Stewart, two brothers, Owen, who is deceased with Jolene, and Jolene is also deceased, and Wayne, her brother, is deceased, and he is married to Marcy. Richmond and Lewiston were the towns where she grew up and attended local school. Irene played the clarinet in the North Cash marching band and participated in many assemblies. She had the most fun with her friends and laughed her way through school. Graduating from seminary and North Cache High School in 1950, Irene met George Butterfield in Smithfield where he ran Jimmy's drive-in with his brother. She was his sweetheart and they were married in the Logan Temple November 10th, 1950. They started their family with the birth of their daughter Shelley, next to son Mitch, and then another daughter Holly. Irene would get the kids dressed up and walk to Logan's Main Street to go to Jensen's Candy Store, Bon Marche, or J.C. Penney's. Card clubs were popular with Irene's friends. The ladies would meet at each other's house to laugh and talk. George worked with a great bunch of guys at Wonder Bread, and they got together as a Wonder Bread bunch with their wives that would meet once a month usually to play cards. Irene started working for J.C. Penney's part-time around 1960 and went full-time in 1966, retiring in April, 1997. But she missed her social life there and went back part-time to cover for the lunch hours for the girls until um, the head office realized that they had a 71-year-old lady working there and that um, they suggested she retire again. <laughs> 
you couldn't miss her in the 60s with her big red hair. And in the store, they loved to call her Big Red. She was always in high school and dressed with her special classy style. She had a distinctive clip in her step when she walked down the stairs in the old J.C. Penney's. At break time, you could find her at the Bluebird, sitting at a special stool, drinking her cup of coffee. Lunch on Saturdays with mom was always special. Irene made lots of friends through working and she missed it every day. 1960, she joined the Royal Bakery team and bowled as long as she could until her legs just wouldn't let her. She bowled with lots of other teams and her last team was with Jack's Tire and Oil on Wednesday Night Ladies League. In 1969, her circle of bowling friends decided to go to the National Bowling Tournament in San Diego, California. The Women's International Bowling Congress Advertising Committee singled this, this team out to follow and make a movie about how they handled their first national tournament. She loved it and she traveled to 26 national tournaments in the United States. Irene loved bowling, laughing with her bowling friends and winning. Bowling was something else she constantly missed. She took up golfing starting at Sherwood Hills and she enjoyed making new friends on all the different courses. She really got into following the jazz and she loved it when she was able to go see a live game. Lions conventions with George took her to many places in the United States, Hawaii, Mexico, Australia. A trip to England with her friend Rose Niederhauser was one of her favorite trips. Irene went to Hawaii with her sister Maxine, Shelley and Holly. Irene traveled to visit Maxine when she lived outside of Utah. Irene had many different circles of friends and enjoyed people. She loved to laugh and do unexpected tricks to get you to laugh with her. Sometimes if you didn't really know her, she was, she was rather intimidating, but it never took too long to start laughing with her. Her hair was always done perfect and she did not like anyone to touch it. Of course, that only provoked the grandkids to tease her by touching her hair, but everybody usually touched it once and after she yelled at them, they didn't touch it again except the, except Brevin. When he'd go with me to get her hair done, he'd sit in the back seat in his seatbelt and he would throw spit wads at her. He would touch her with the window cleaner. He would done, done everything. And of course he learned a lot of new words that time. <laughs> Colby was very young and really couldn't talk good, but he knew when we was going to mom because he would say, Grandma Ding Dongs? And uh, that kind of fit her, but it really wasn't what he was relating to. It was her doorbell he liked. But um, she went by Grandma Ding Dong for quite a while. Irene lived in Providence for 49 years and enjoyed the houses that George built for them. She was an immaculate housekeeper and you knew what you could touch and what you could not. She loved to drive her Lincoln and was very upset when she did not pass her last driver's test. She would not sell it, and so she was chauffeured in the Lincoln wherever she needed to go. During the last 10 years, she appreciated the help from her neighbors, especially Brad and Robin Hanson and their kids. They were always there for her, and she especially loved Brad when he had parked his police car in his driveway. She just always felt safe with that feeling. Uh, she always had good ministering sisters and ministering couples. She loved her meals on wheels. She loved having her house cleaned by the ladies that would come in and clean. She formed many good friendships with them. Yard care services. She loved her yard to look nice. She loved her outings to get her hair done. And Denise Johnson would come to her house and do her manicure and pedicure when she just couldn't make it into the, the salon anymore. And there was always a family member available to help her out. And she was able to live in her home year, own home 10 years after dad passed away. And we just put her in Cache Valley Sist living the last 10 years and we just couldn't keep her safe at home. Irene is survived by her sisters, Maxine Stewart, her three children and spouses, Jerry, Shelley Gill, Mitch, Stark Holbrook, Holly, Wayne Allen. She was grandma to seven child grandchildren, Colby, Sherry Gill, Wayne, Holly, Wayne Allen, and she was grandma to, great grandma to um, 
17 kids. Let's see if I can find my place. Colby, Kelly, Jasmine, Jensen, Dylan, Chelsea, Justin, Cassidy, and 17 great grandchildren, Shaley Gill, Braxton Gill, Carter Gill, Brevin Gill, Athena Pratt, Riley Butterfield, Balin Butterfield, Braden Moreland, Lincoln Moreland, Addie Allen, Kate Allen, Caden Curry, Lily Curry, Brody Bauer, Bentley Brower, Riley Brower, and Garrett Brower. And two great great granddaughters, Naomi Owens and Finley Pratt. She was preceded in death by her husband, parents, brothers Owen Wayne Johnson, and granddaughter Jasmine Jensen. In 2015, Holly helped mom outline what she would like to have at her funeral. We tried her best to hold to her wishes. We would like to thank the people that pro participated in the program today. We appreciate Joyce and Larry for traveling to be here today. Thanks to Suzette Clevin for styling her hair. She looked beautiful. And the family would like to express our thanks and appreciation to Cache Valley Assisted Living and staff for their kindness, exceptional care and friendships. Special thanks to Atlas Hospice for their compassionate service to our mom while she was at CVAL. We would not have been able to deal with many of her unique situations without the open communication we had with her. Love you, Rini. Look at your paper when you have sweet hands. First of all, I'd like to um, thank everybody for singing that um, that song. Um, I had to I had to chuckle at what she had wrote down. She wrote, "Oh, it is wonderful." And so when Shelley when we was talking about it, I said, well, it says here she wants to play, Oh, It Is Wonderful, and Shelly goes, that's not the name of the song. <laughs> but that's what mom called it, so it was, it was funny. Um, I'm grateful for the love and the laughter that I had with my mom. It's hard to be up here talking about the passing of her. I was with her on the 15th of February, and we had a great visit. She couldn't hear me very well, and the thing she thought she heard was hilarious. I, so I laughed and then she laughed. She was always waiting for a comeback, you know, so that she could say something. But that was the last day that I heard her laugh. She loved sitting on her patio and watching the cars go by and having that good cup of coffee. She loved flowers and good, easy listening music. Matlock was a favorite too. She enjoyed going to Angie's and Maddox and seeing friends. Mom loved bowling. She was, she was always telling me, don't you ever give up bowling unless you break a leg. And I hope I don't ever have to give up bowling, but she missed it so much. She was on a different team than Shelly and I. And so when we bowled her team, Jack's Tire and Oil, it was always a competition. And she loved it when they, when they would beat us, but we loved it when we beat them. Um, it, bowling was more than showing up to the bowling alley. She loved the atmosphere. She had so many friends. She enjoyed being sergeant of the arm of arms and going and telling people they had to move their kids. But more than anything, she loved going to the national bowling tournaments with her friends. I think that it was 10% bowling, 90% laughing. I started writing letters to her and I tucked the letter in her bowling shirt the night before she left to go to nationals. One year I found a letter on my pillow from her. It meant the world to me that she had left that letter and I still have that letter. Tucked inside was $2 bill. It was $2 to go and get me a treat. When I was going through all the cards that mom's friends had sent her way, I found this friendship poem. And um, it must've been very important to her. It looked like it had been um, unfolded and folded many times. 
And it pretty well sums up the love that she had for all of her friends. The women who've walked with me, I say a loving thanks. We've covered lots of inner ground while tightening our shanks. We've talked of poetry and clothes and recipes and mothers, decor and war and kids and our significant male others. We've talked of social policy, of things we love and fear, of fate and weight and films and books, and AIDS was big that year. Together we have laughed and cried and grown a little older. Without you all, my world would seem much lonelier and colder. And so once more, my loving thanks to friends who last and last. May we continue walking slow and talking very fast. She worked for Penny's many years and she loved the social part of the job. She enjoyed training the new girls on the computer. She loved going to the Bluebird for coffee twice a day. And let's not forget about mom being a classy lady. Her nice clothes and her high heels. She loved to look nice. I remember talking to her one day around the 4th of July and she says, I just don't know what I'm gonna wear. And I go, what do you mean, mom? And she said, well, they said to wear Levi's and it just isn't right. So she had to go buy some Levi's and I'm sure she wore red high heels. Um, someone asked her the other day, how long have you worked at Penny's, Irene? And she said, 80 years. <laughs> and I'm sure that it seemed like that as she looked back and reflected on the many years of service to the company and recalling the good memories and friends that she had met. One of those friends was Ed from Plant Peddler. He's the one that did the flowers and I have to say it was just such a beautiful thing that he did. I think he added a few more than what we ordered, but well, they're, they're beautiful. Mom and I did lots of fun things together as I was growing up. She was a pretty good sport. I remember talking her into dragging Maine one night some of you young kids won't know what that is, but you drive back and forth down Main Street. And, <laughs> and I wanted to go see if I could see this boy that I kind of liked. Well, we seen him and I slumped down in the seat and I go, and she was going slow. I said, mom, what are you doing? And she goes, well, there's a girl there and I'm trying to look at her to see if I know her parents. I didn't ask her to do that again, but that was, that was my mom. <laughs> she, she was just funny like that. I'm grateful for the love and laughter and the friendship that I had with my mom. And I wanted to share the Jets and Candy story too, just because she would just get us all dressed up in the morning like we were going to church and go up to Jets and Candy place for her coffee and our hot chocolate. And we obviously both remember that because we did it every morning. It was just kind of a funny thing. But um, we had some great family parties at mom and dad's house. And I admired the sense of humor that she had. She'd say funny things and that made the grandkids laugh. And so we got a good laugh too. She was witty right up to when she had her stroke on that Tuesday night. Another thing that I always admired about my mom was she said her prayers every day. She prayed that us kids would get home safely and prayed for various blessings for us and our families. I remember a time when I was struggling and I was talking to my mom. She told me not to worry that she would pray and that God would take care of the rest. It was a comfort to me to hear that coming from my mom. Mom, I thank you at this time for being a good example to me and my family and for the love I have had from you all of my lifetime. It was a comfort to me. It was very... It's a comfort to me. It's hard to say goodbye, and I'm thankful for the great memories. In Isaiah 55, 12, it says, You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. That kind of just sounds like mom heading home. Thank you, Larry and Joy Smart, for visiting her every month. She looks so forward to seeing you. Thank you, Jeannie. What a special person you've been all these years to my mom. 
so grateful for your kindness. Kindness. I found this little card from Jeannie. I'm hoping that you didn't leave it on Friday. Dear Irene, I think of you often. I hope you're settling in at your new location. I hope to be able to see you in person soon. Love, Jeannie. I know that you didn't send it on Friday. And sorry, I just had to put a little humor into my talk here. Um, so I wrote this poem the day that mom passed away. My mother has her tickets. She's saying her last goodbye. She won't miss that train. She won't even try. She has laughed her laugh and made us laugh and bid her fond farewell. Her family's near and friends are dear. So make that pathway clear. Don't be sad, just be glad that you knew this special lady. A laugh so contagious, her jokes outrageous and always a comeback too. So you're ready to go, it's the last of the show. The whistles are blowing, it's now time to go. We love you mom and we're grateful too that we knew such a lady as fun as you. I wanted to thank Brad also as her neighbor, Shelly's kind of summed it up, how she just so enjoyed him parking his police car out by the road, kind of so it looked like, you know, there was a cop there, so. She enjoyed that. And we'd like, and I'd like to thank all of the workers at Cash Valley Assisted Living. Thank you for laughing with her and comforting her those days before she passed away. Just knowing how well she treated, just how well she was treated means the world to our family. A big thank to Ross Thomas, the administrator. The day we took mom to the rest home, he came in with his guitar and sang songs that she liked. And it was just so special. She just really liked that. Played his guitar and sang. And she requested that he sing crazy at her funeral. He'll follow me as I, when I sit down. Thanks again, mom, for your love of laughter. Making us laugh was a blessing. I love you, Rini, and I'm gonna miss you, but I'll never forget all of the good times and the memories and the funny things that you said. And I'll say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You guys did good. They can do better than me. Holly and Shelly asked me to say a few words. I'm Ross, I'm the administrator of Cash Valley Assisted Living. Best part of my job is getting to know our residents. The worst part of my job is saying goodbye. We became family. I apologize for the restrictions of COVID. Thank you for coming to see her often and for the rest of you that spent the last few moments with her. My wife met the two daughters and introduced her to Cash Valley Assisted Living. She's back there today. My two resident care coordinators are here, Shannon and Molly. They cared for her. They loved her, they laughed together. I often joke with Molly sometimes that she could be part of the family because she's that crazy. And she just did that. <laughs> <laughs> A few things I just wanted to say real quick about Irene. She didn't hear too well. So sometimes I'd say a few things and all I got was a... <laughs> And I know she had no idea what I said, so I had to talk louder. I looked at her pictures of her growing up and her bowling, and what an amazing woman. You guys are very, very blessed to have her in her life. Thank you for sharing her with us at Cash Valley Assisted Living. The one thing that I'll remember, and I'll never fade, whenever I hear the word Irene, are three ladies sitting together, talking, laughing, and yelling, hey, Irene. That's all I, that's all I remember every time I hear Irene.
And they asked me to sing a song and sing the song Crazy. I thought of Irene. She was a bit crazy at times, but what a wonderful woman. The best part of my job is getting to know people at the, the last parts of their lives and trying to figure out their stories when they were young, just like the rest of us. I've got two teenagers that think I'm just an old man. And I have to remind them that everybody's got a story. And boy, did Irene have a story. So I'm going to share a song with, with you folks the, that she wanted to hear, that these two asked me to play probably the last day she was with us, right? Came in and sang it for a couple of days before. And I apologize, give me a few minutes to get my grab, grab my guitar. So if I was just sitting over at Cash Valley and Irene came out, she'd sit there in a row and just stare at me and wink. <laughs> I'd be okay. But I'd sit in front of her right here. So be and you all ask me to sing a song that uh, I don't sing too often. Sometimes I forget the words, so if I make some of them, that's how it goes. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy for feeling so lonely. Oh, I'm crazy. Crazy for feeling so blue. I knew. Love me as long as I want to. And then someday you leave me for somebody new. Worry, why do I let myself worry? Wondering what in the world I do. Oh, I'm crazy, thinking that my love can hold you. Crazy for crying. Crazy for trying. And crazy for loving you. You're blessed by me, ever. That's hard. <laughs> My very first memory of Irene was when I was a little girl. I was small enough to stand in a circle, a rack of clothes at JCPenney and be completely hidden. I had to be about six years old. I could peer out and see this beautiful lady with perfectly coiffed hair and jangly bracelets and a beautiful manicure. I wanted to be just like her. This was the second floor of the J.C. Penney's location on Main Street. She was a vision and she made quite an impression on this little girl. Later, when I was a young mom, the same stately, beautiful woman with a big laugh was now working at the mall location. 
of JCPenney's. Many years later, Larry and I moved to Providence and there she was in our ward. When she told us about working at Penny's for all those years, the pieces fell into place about my family, my childhood memories. She still had the same perfectly coiffed hair, but it was now white. She still had the very same jangly bracelets and the beautiful manicured nails. But what was most unmistakable was her big laugh. Okay. Yeah, Irene talked a lot about working at JCPenney and she said that she could outwork anybody there in high heels. You know, I've never tried that myself with heels, but I can imagine how strong her legs had to be. And that's probably why she's a good bowler. Uh, also, it was, kind of, it was mentioned earlier about how many years she worked at JCPenney. So Joyce and I were called as to teach math at BYU White, and I still never figured out the math on how she worked 75 and 80 years at JCPenney. <laughs> that was always pretty fun. So when we first moved to Providence, I was assigned to be a home teacher to George and Irene, and I was assigned a young man to go with me from the from the young man's. And I just remember how always welcome we were to come to their home. And their home was immaculate. And we'd walk in there and see it was just really beautiful. And one of the fun things I enjoyed is watching George and Irene tease each other. It was really fun. Sometimes George would say something about Irene and then look over at us and wink. And it was pretty fun, but George, but Irene got her licks in too. I remember uh, some of the things she said, like, George, nobody wants to hear you play that damn harmonica. <laughs> and I'd always disagree. I always said I loved it. Or, George, when are you going to clean up that shed? <laughs> and she would talk about the shed out there and all the stuff that George had in it. She warned me, don't ever go in there because it smells so bad because of all the cats. <laughs> so I never did go in. But it was fun to see them interact like that. But you also knew they loved each other. You could just feel that. There's no animosity there. It was just really fun to be around. So they were a great couple, and she never did speak ill of George ever, especially after he died. I wasn't able to go to George's funeral, so I always felt bad about that. So I'm very happy that I'd be able to be here today to help honor Irene. As you know, Irene was a lovely person. You always knew exactly where you stood with her. She didn't keep her opinions to herself. She told us she knew which people she liked and which people she didn't like. And she said, I like you two a lot. She was a glorious example of a strong and confident woman. We were blessed to be in her circle of friends. When George died, I became Larry's visiting partner. We had so much fun listening to her stories of bullying and about the adventures that she had with her girlfriends from North Cash and about her crazy coworkers at Penny's. We discovered that we both had a maiden name of Johnson and so we were trying to figure out if we could possibly be related to each other. We decided we weren't, but it was okay because we just still shared the name. She would just discuss the Utah Jazz games with Larry and she always asked me how my mother was doing since they were the same age. She was so proud of her kids, her grandkids and her great grandkids. When each visit was over, she let me kiss her on the cheek and then she would return my kiss with a big hug. So when Joyce and I became a measuring couple, we got to move out of the immaculate living room into the nice cozy warm kitchen. So I really enjoyed just coming and sitting at the kitchen table with her and uh, it was fun to look at her fridge. Her fridge was just completely covered with pictures of all of you, the family. And she loved to talk about you individually. So I could tell she had a, a great love. And then if weather permitted, we would move out onto the back patio because she loved to be outside and we would visit with her there when the weather was good and get serenaded by all her wind chimes. That was really nice. I just thought of a few, some of Irene's attributes I just wanted to highlight. One is positive outlook. Irene was not a complainer and did not dwell on things she didn't have or things she couldn't do. She always reminisced in a positive way. She had a sense of humor. Humor That's been touched on many times already. Our visits always included laughter. 
Many times she would like to throw out a few cuss words and then kind of just smile and wait for a reaction. And that was always with a twinkle in her eye, of course. And that was really, I always thought that was really cute, but I always told her that, hey, I used to work around sheep herders, sheep herders so throw anything you want at me, I can take it. <laughs> uh, she also was cheerful and friendly. I was impressed when we would take Irene to some of the special uh, second ward functions. We'd go to pick her up and she was just always just in perfect condition, well-dressed, her hair was just perfect. And we really enjoyed taking her to these ward functions. And then when we would bring her in, usually into the uh, cultural hall there, it was fun to watch all the different ward members come up and talk to her and, and be greeted by her warm smile and her greeting. So she was, she was a real light to those around her. And then gratitude. She always let us know how appreciative she was for our visits. And she also expressed always appreciation for her family. I would be remiss if I did not mention how much Irene appreciated all of her children and what they did for her in her later years. And she never failed to mention multiple times in a visit what Holly and Shelly had been doing for her to help her out. And boy, I'm so glad I've got three daughters because that's going to be really nice having daughters <laughs> take care of me when I'm he older. You would say that every time we leave the house. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm so grateful I have daughters just like Shelly and Holly. So in August of 2018, Larry and I left for a two-year teaching mission to Brigham Young University teaching in the math department. While we were there, I wrote letters to her telling her about her adventures with lizards and with cockroaches and the humidity that was, you know, it's paradise, but it's paradise loaded with creatures. And um, we also shared stories about the warm winters, the beautiful beaches, and about the students that we taught who were from all over the world. One of my treasured memories is a sweet letter that she sent to us while we were there. It was written in her very shaky hand. We had to look really carefully to decipher what she was saying, but what it was there was that she was thanking us for the letters that we sent, and she told us again that she loved us. We knew that her health and memory were declining, but there she was, thinking of us and determined to write back. We returned to Utah in the midst of the pandemic, and we were unable to see her again. What a comfort there is knowing that we will see her again someday. And when we join her in the next life, she's just around the corner, just out of our view. I actually feel like I can feel her here today. As she's enjoying the happy memories and looking down at her posterity with love. In our future reunion, George can play his harmonica for us. She can cuss at him and we can share more memories with Irene. It's hard to see through rain. Okay. So Irene wasn't one, wasn't one to go to church on Sundays. That wasn't her thing. But I think, uh, and she was always willing to listen to our message. And that was nice. But we never did have a lot of deep gospel discussions. But I think, I feel Irene had testimony of the gospel in many ways. Uh, she loved the beauty of the earth that God created for us as part of his great plan of happiness. She treated others with kindness, as Jesus would have us do. She had imperfections, just like the rest of God's children here on earth. So Irene and all of us will be blessed by our Savior's redeeming grace when we return to him. It's my hope and prayer that the family and loved ones of Irene Butterfield will feel the comforting spirit at this time. And I hope that all of us can use her life and legacy as inspiration to do good and to love one another. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The one disadvantage that you have being last is it's all been said. But I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. Before I was even here, my mother and dad lived in Richmond. And daddy got out of the war after World War II. Mother would have been about 21 and Irene would have been about 15. But they only lived a block away. And so if they were out and about, they were busy. All these giggly girls, and I'm sure mother was involved. 
But anyway, so mother had this connection with Irene from the time she was a teenager. So when we moved to Logan um, years later, Shelly and I took dance together at the old armory on First West in Logan. So we got to catch up with Irene again. Now, really, I do not remember Irene having red hair. <laughs> do not. She was a blonde and then it was white. Don't remember red hair. But anyway, and then every time we went to Penny's, it's the same story. She always looked so classy. I mean, it was jewelry, it was makeup, it was hair. Always looked beautiful. But the difference was, from now, is it wasn't Tifa, it wasn't Levi's and t-shirts that was waiting on you. It was somebody waiting on you. Where was something? She walked you to it. She helped you find it. She was just a service-oriented person. She was. She loved people, and it showed in the work that she did. Don and I moved to Providence in 1975, and um, the very first calling I had was to write a spotlight on somebody. Well, I knew some people in Providence, but I didn't know many, but I did know I read. So I wrote this little spotlight on Marie, and it came out in the newsletter. And she called me after, and she says, I'm so grateful you wrote that. I didn't know anybody in Providence like me, and it broke my heart, because I just loved her. So for at least 40 years, if not more, I've been her Relief Society teacher, and then her visiting teacher, and then her ministry teacher, and while Larry and Joyce were gone, we were her couple of ministers, whatever. But we just loved Irene. And it's the very same reason everybody else has talked. Irene was Irene. She was Irene in front of the bishop. She was Irene in front of the visiting teachers. She was Irene. And we loved her because of it. Okay. The sad part was, is this last year, I haven't been able to go see her. And so for occasions, I would just drop something at the door and I would say, how is Irene? Well, on her birthday, I took something, which was like the ninth, wasn't very far ahead. And I said to him, so how's Irene? And she says, she's Irene. <laughs> I just started to laugh. I thought that was hysterical. But then on Valentine's, I took something. And it was when they were saying they were starting to open up. And I was thinking, maybe I'll get in. And I said, so how is she? And they said, she can't come out of her room. So that was the clue kind of that maybe she wasn't doing quite so well. In the early days of this being teaching, you know, I mean, took her a little while to get close to you. So she'd never tell me if she was sick, if she needed anything, she wouldn't tell me. We just kept talking, bowling, golfing, walking. Anyway, we just kept visiting. I'd take my grandkids if I didn't have a visiting teacher companion, and my grandkids fell in love with her, would sit on the patio, and eat candy, and talk and laugh. And so anyway, we just built a relationship till as she got a little older and started having health issues, whether it was a surgery or a fall when she hit her head, then she would call me and let me know what was going on, if I could help her. Well, it was after one of these situations that she called and she said, no, I guess I called her and I said, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, I'd like to have my friends over for coffee. I says, okay, what do you want me to do? And she says, well, you can make some cookies. I said, I can do that. So it was like on a Saturday morning, I took her cookies down and I said, no, what else do you need me to do? And she says, I need you to make coffee. <laughs> I started to laugh. I said, I mean, I've never made coffee in my life. I said, when my father-in-law comes, he gets instant coffee because <laughs> She says, I'll tell you how. So she told me how to get the coffee maker started and I filled up the coffee thing. Off I went and she had a great time. It was with the flower lady from River Heights and that much anyway. So I thought that was interesting that I finally was into that circle that she knew that she could ask me to make coffee and I'd do it. So it was just funny. Um, but the one thing I wanted to end up with is it was talked about a little bit. Irene might not have been to church every Sunday wasn't her thing but she loved the Lord she did and we talked about this several different times over the years and as you get older you young people might not know as you get older you get a lot closer to the Lord because you recognize at some point this life's going to be over and we would talk about that and she would say 
I would never go to bed without saying my prayers. I love the Lord. And, and to me, that said it all. It said it all. We just talked about it, and she loved her Savior. She wasn't afraid of dying because she was comfortable with him. And so when they talked about, when I talked to Shelly, and she says, oh, it is wonderful, the song. And I just started to laugh. And I said, you know, of all the songs, this one probably explained Irene's relationship to the Savior better than any. So I was going to close with reading just the verses of I Stand All Amazed because she did love her Savior. I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me, confused the grace that so fully he proffers me. I tremble to know that for me he was crucified, that for me a sinner he suffered, he bled and died. I marvel that he would descend from his throne divine to rescue a soul so rebellious and proud as mine. That he should extend his great love unto such as I, sufficient to own, to redeem, and to justify. I think of his hands pierced and bleeding to pay the debt. What mercy, such love and devotion can I forget? No, no. I will praise and adore at the mercy seat until at glorified throne I kneel at his feet. Oh, it is wonderful that he should care for me enough to die for me. Oh, it is wonderful, wonderful to me. Irene has gone home to her savior. She's gone home to George. And she will say to him, nobody wants to hear your harmonica or hell George. <laughs> But she loved him. Occasionally, she would give him the one finger salute. <laughs> and every time she did, I had to laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> because it was so irony. I just loved her because she was so open, so honest, and so the same to everyone. I love you, Irene. I'm going to miss you. I'm grateful for her influence in my life for the last 40 years. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the words are on the back side of you.
Well, uh, great memories and thoughts we've had about Irene. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting how small the world is sometimes. Um, I grew up in Providence, and uh, Colby and I have known each other for quite some time. We're, he's a little younger than me, but uh, growing up in the same town, you get to know who the other boys are. It's close to my brother's age. And then about 22 years ago, I started working at more business. And um, Shelly Gill worked there, and she was the consummate professional. Uh, I always thought of her as calm under pressure. You know, we sometimes had to deal with some unpleasant customers, and uh, Shelly always handled that so well. And then about 18 years ago, my wife and I moved our little family into the White House across the street from George and Irene Butterfield. And uh, we lived in that little house for a few years. And um, that house had some irrigation water with it. And so my wife, we were trying to figure out how to save a little money, water in the lawn and stuff. So my wife was trying to figure out the irrigation water. And, and George Butterfield came over and helped her figure all, all that out, how to do the irrigation water and how to chase it down, who to go check if it wasn't there. And, and so it was such a great help to us. You know, we're just friendly neighbors across the street. And, and my wife, wife loved George Butterfield. And so when we ended up moving back into the second ward, and the first time I went and saw Irene, I was telling her this story. I reminded her, hey, we used to look across the street from in. George came out and taught my wife how to do the irrigation water stuff. She just thought, oh, that George, he just loved his irrigation water. And then just laughed, just this big laugh. And uh, to me, that's my, my favorite memory of hers, that she's always laughing. She always had a glint in her eye, looking for something to say and, and something funny. And uh, what a great lady. Uh, I appreciated knowing her and her family and my association with, with y'all. I just want to share a couple of scriptures. You know, death may, helps us in some ways wonder if what we believe is true. Uh, what happens after death? And I just want to read a few scriptures that um, I believe give us confidence on where Irene is and what will happen to us one day. And John says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my father. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. I truly believe that we will be resurrected, that we will meet our Savior, our families, and that we will have a joyous reunion. And that is what Irene is in for, a joyous reunion. In Job it says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and not another. I know that Jesus Christ lives and loves us. I'm grateful for that knowledge and the hope that it gives me, and the comfort it gives us at this time. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
We'll now uh, have a closing prayer offered by Brother Don Brill, after which the graveside services will be held at the Providence City Cemetery. There, a dedication of the grave will be offered by Wayne Allen, a son-in-law. Reminder to the family that there will be a luncheon offered here in the back room after the graveside service. Brother Brill. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the service that we've had here this day. We thank thee for having many years to have enjoyed Sister Butterfield and her wonderful personality. We now know that she's in good hands and in comfort, and we pray thou would bless all of her friends and family with the comfort of knowing that they will get to see her again and renew many old memories that we will all have our opportunity to pass back to thee and to enjoy thy presence, enjoy good health and renewed bodies. We pray that would bless all those that are here today, watch over them as they travel and be with each of us that we might know and build our testimonies of thee. Father in heaven, for all thy many wonderful blessings, we thank thee and we most humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.